It's flashback time, guys. Let's go back to when the Earth was 3.5 billion years old. That's like very early Earth. Back when life was single-celled. The Earth was very different from today. For example, the continents were still forming, and the days were a mere six hours long, because the Earth was spinning much faster than today. For millions of years, the Earth's surface has been changing. Erupting volcanoes built up islands of lava and ash that polluted the seas. The atmosphere was filled with gases, and there was no oxygen or ozone, so ultraviolet rays bathed the Earth. All these things brought many chemical changes to the waters. For millions of years, this chemical soup thickened and changed. <laughs> And that's one thing that I kind of thought was funny too, is a uh, chemical soup is not some like term I just made up, like in, I've seen like multiple documentaries for this episode and they call it chemical soup. Like that's the fucking scientific term for it. Well, anyway, uh, larger molecules come from this chemical soup and cause amino acids to form around them, making protein. They could also produce copies of themselves. And one of these molecules is uh, DNA, which is the basis of all life. We all have DNA in us. Their arrangement is uh, like a sort of code that builds more proteins. Sometimes the DNA splits, and both sides attract other halves, making two new copies that are identical. So they kind of make like clones of themselves. And this is how life started. But sometimes there's a mistake in the code, which is also called mutation. This causes uh, variation in the first cells, and natural selection sorts them out. The mutations that benefited life usually stayed, while the ones that didn't eventually died off. So, uh, life continued evolving this way, changing the environment around them, first by oxygenizing the atmosphere, then causing the Earth to freeze over, becoming the snowball Earth we talked about in uh, last episode. And that's because like, the increased oxygen levels due to the snowball Earth actually probably continued, uh, contributed to today's episode, which is E.D.A. Karen, and the uh, Cambrian Explosion, which is the next episode. So yeah, like uh, today's episode is on the E.D.A. Karen, uh, with the primary focus on the E.D.A. Karen life following after the snowball Earth. You can find all that and more on Down the Line. Alright, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Pete. And today we're going to be talking about the Idiot Karen, which spans from the end of the Cryogenian period at 635 million years ago to the beginning of the Cambrian period at 543 million years ago. Uh, it marks the end of the Proterozoic Eon and the beginning of the Phanerozoic Eon. It's named after the Idiot Karen Hills of South Australia, where geologist Reg Sprigg first discovered fossils of the Idiot Karen biota. This dude's name was Reg Sprigg, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about the Vendian too, which I guess the Idiot Karen period overlaps, but is shorter than the Vendian period which is a name that was earlier in 1952 proposed by Russian geologist and paleontologist Boris Sokolov. And this really confused me, because from what I've seen, the Vendian and Idea Karen are the, are the same thing. They're just different names to describe the period. And then the Vendian is said to have started around 650 million years ago, as opposed to the Idea Karen, which, like I said, starts at 635. Um, the Vendian seems to have been proposed first, and I guess the Idiot Karen is like a newer term for the period, but they're the same thing. So I don't, I don't know. I was really confused by that. Uh, I guess the Idiot Karen is like a newer term for it, but they're all, it's during the same period, the same fossils, same life. Everything is the same. So I don't know what was up with that. I confused the shit out of me. <laughs> the Idiot Karen period represents the time from the end of the Baranoan glaciation, which happened at the end of the last episode, to the first appearance worldwide of somewhat complicated trace fossils. Although the Idiot Karen period does contain soft-bodied fossils, uh, it is unusual in comparison to later periods because its beginning is not defined by a change in the fossil record. Rather, the beginning is defined at the base of a chemically distinct carbonate layer that is referred to as a cap carbonate because it caps glacial deposits. This bed is characterized by an unusual depletion of carbon that indicates a sudden climate change at the end of the Marinoan Ice Age. And um, This is just my guess that the... Uh, what this is saying is that the climate change at the end of the Marinoan Ice Age, which is just the world isn't frozen anymore, it's now kind of going back to how it used to be, is where they decided that the E.D. Cairn should start. The lower boundary GSSP, which stands for Global Boundary Stratotype Section and Point of the E.D. Cairn, is at the base of the Cap Carbonate New Salina Formation. It's immediately above the, and I apologize for this because I'm going to butcher the name, but uh, El Tina Diamectite Diamicotite in the Anorama Creek section, Brachina Gorge, Flinders Ranges, South Australia. 
And I didn't even bother to look all that up because, Jesus Christ, you guys in South Australia need to work on shortening your geographic location names because that is fucking bonkers. Holy shit. <laughs> the GSSP of the upper boundary of the Ide Karen is the lower boundary of the Cambrian on the southeast coast of Newfoundland, Canada. And that was really confusing too, but uh, what that's saying is that the end of the Ide Karen is basically the same as the beginning of the Cambrian, which is... Uh, they believe happened on the southeast coast of Newfoundland, Canada. That's where I think all the fossils are for ED care and life and everything. And as for subdivisions, there are actually no formal uh, subdivisions yet. And I think it's because the ED care period is still like really new. It's I think it's the newest, uh, or at least one of the newest periods that we've added in long, like hundreds of years. So uh, they're still trying to figure all that out. And now I'll get into the meat of the episode, which is the biota. I wanted to spend most of the episode talking about the life at this period, just because I think that's more uh, what this period is about, so far, at least. The fossil record for the Edecaran period is sparse, as more easily fossilized hard-shelled animals had yet to evolve. The Edecaran biota include the oldest definite multicellular organisms with specialized tissues, the most common types of which resemble segmented worms and discs. So, you know, they're all probably pretty gross. <laughs> Edicare biota bear little resemblance to modern life forms, and the relationship, even with the immediately following life forms of the Cambrian explosion, is rather difficult to interpret. More than a hundred genera have been described, and well-known forms include Charnia and Dickinsonia, which both are actually featured in one of the documentaries that I watched for this episode in preparation, which is called First Life. It's a documentary with David Attenborough, and I really recommend all these documentaries that I'm going to talk about in this episode. I really recommend they they do a really good job of explaining everything and talking about the life at this time and maybe what it even looked like. Some of them even like uh, added CGI so that you could see like or like pictures so that of well, what they think it, that the fossils might have been when they were life, you know. And uh, I guess I'll just talk actually about some of the documentaries right now and and see if I can explain the life at this time through that so i will talk about the first life documentary right now which uh i guess i guess i'll just talk about the charney and dickinsonia those are two that were heavily featured in that documentary and charnia uh, was an ediacaran life form that grew on the seafloor and is believed to have fed on nutrients in the water it lived in deep water far below the zone where photosynthesis can occur and then dickinsonia were long and round and moved around the seafloor at incredibly slow speeds a description for the Edicaran animals is actually really difficult because they just don't look like anything we have today. Like somewhere between uh, worms, snails, and bugs. Like they just, they don't look like anything that we could really use to describe it. It's like a mixture of all these weird animals. Although I highly recommend that you look up pictures of the fossils of both these animals. Um, and then the, I think it was from this documentary, they had some CGI videos and pictures of what they might have looked like. That's what I was saying earlier. And it, and it is just like how I describe them, little worm alien bug things. They're, they're definitely interesting and unlike anything we have now. So that's really cool. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about for for this uh, documentary too, the most interesting part I found in this episode is a scene where the, a, my, uh, not micro, a marine biologist takes a sponge, which obviously has animal cells. It was probably the first animal. And he pushes it through a syringe until it becomes like a clump of cells. And I guess it's actually a pretty humane way to look at animal cells because a sponge can't feel pain. That's why they do it. And when looking through a telescope, after three weeks, the cells would come together to form like little uh, micro sponges or something. And, and this is possibly, the reason that they even showed this was this is possibly how early life formed. After the snowball earth, the increase in oxygen in the air causes cells which previously avoided each other to come together, making shapes and skin and pretty much anything that would eventually become an animal. Like us. <laughs> it's important to note that all the fossils we see of these creatures were at the time of their life underwater on the ocean floor. Millions of years brought them up above the water where we can actually see the fossils of these ocean creatures today. And they would show in these documentaries too, like, uh, like a cliff overlooking the ocean. And they do talk about that, how that, that cliff, you know, millions of years ago was actually the sea floor, which I thought was super interesting. It's also believed that a, a new type of reproduction was introduced around that time of the Ediacaran biota. It's believed that how a, like how a coral reef will unleash all its sperm and eggs at the same time, which would then fertilize and then grow like a plant out of the ground. Some Ediacaran animals probably actually did the same. 
uh, they probably weren't the first to sexually reproduce, as you may remember from a few episodes back when I talked about when sexual reproduction probably started. Um, but at the E.D. Karen, it was, it was so much more common than it had ever been before. And this sped up diversity, which uh, sped up natural selection, and therefore evolution. And so the E.D. Karen life uh, had no mouth, stomach, or organs at all. The food that they ate was converted straight into energy, but moving actually took a lot of the energy. So they were technically an evolutionary dead end. Although, as it is discussed in the BBC podcast In Our Time, Idea Karen Biota, they can be seen as a stepping stone to the Cambrian animals, which had a mouth, stomach, and anus in which to store and convert food to get more energy. So were the Idea Karen really a dead end, or did they just do exactly what they were supposed to until more advanced life forms could evolve? Um, were they really like a failure or a success for their time? And I think that's a really interesting thing. They do talk about that a lot in the, that podcast I was telling you about in our time, the E.A. Karen Biota episode. It is really good. It's about 45 minutes long. And, uh, and they really get into that. It's like, even though they didn't have the organs or body parts that they needed to kind of, uh, not be an evolutionary dead end, it's like, are we expecting too much from them? you know, to, to do something that hadn't even existed yet, you know, are we expecting too much of them when they probably evolutionary led to the Cambrian explosion, which gave them all these, uh, body parts that they could use to store food and convert it. And so, uh, in the next episode, we'll discuss the Cambrian explosion and a new age of life on earth. Pro like that probably came from the AD Karen life. Before that, though, I thought we would end this episode with an interesting way to look at not just life, but time itself. So the following is a quote from David Attenborough from another documentary of his that I also recommend called Life on Earth. He says, These immense periods of time baffle the imagination. But perhaps we can get some idea of the relative lengths of the various stages. If we condense the whole history of life on Earth into one year, then 10 million years becomes one day on that calendar, I'd be talking to you in the very last moment of December 31st, and primitive man will have appeared only a few hours ago in the early afternoon. The first backboned animal will have crawled up onto land during the last week of November. And so, like he says, uh, also in this documentary, life would have begun all the way back in January. And man, I just think what an interesting way to look at our short time on this earth and how much we've changed it and, and you know if everything was put into one year we've changed the world so much in only a few hours worth of time i just thought that was a really interesting way to to end this i guess just to talk about not just people but but time itself so thanks for watching and i'll see you next episode